is how we communicate today. We need eye-catching graphics to compete to get attention. In this course, we're gonna create those graphics in Photoshop. Some of the major topics that we'll cover include using artboards to be able to create multiple images at once, how to make your images fit in different sizes and formats, adding backgrounds, gradients, borders, and text. By the end of this course, you'll know how to quickly and easily create social media graphics in Photoshop. Before beginning the course, it's helpful to be a little bit familiar with Photoshop, but not necessary. I hope you'll join me today to learn creating social media graphics with Photoshop here at Pluralsight. Hi, my name is Melissa Pacone, and we're going to get started creating social media graphics by creating some new files and taking a look at artboards inside of Adobe Photoshop. When we open up Adobe Photoshop, it presents us with the start screen. The start screen will show us the last images that we were working on, and we have choices in how we want to view them. I have my set to view thumbnails. You can also look at list view. You can sort them however you'd like from last opened by name, size, or kind, but we're more concerned with what's happening on the left hand side. So it's showing me my recent files. I can also choose CC files. If I have uploaded files to my Creative Cloud, I can access them here from the start screen and any Lightroom photos that I may have been working on recently. I can also create a new document or open an existing document. At the bottom, I can also search for images on Adobe Stock. I'm going to go ahead and create a new document. And here in the new document window, I have some tabs at the top, which allow me to choose what I'm going to be working with. So again, I have recent documents, save documents. If I'm working with photos, I can choose that. I have print, art and illustration, web, mobile, film, and video. We are interested in working with images for the web with social media graphics. When I choose the web tab, you can see that I have some blank document presets. They're all preset with some sizes that we might use to create graphics on the web. I also have templates here available to me. These are free templates that Adobe has provided from Adobe Stock for you to use. It's a great way to get started or just explore and see how someone else may have created something similar similar to what you want to create. And you can see that I've already downloaded some of these templates to take a look at them by the little blue check mark that is over some of them. Over on the right hand side, I can start to create my own custom document. If I want, I can name it right away. I don't have to. I can name it later on when I'm ready to save my document. I can type in my width and height and choose pixels. It's all set up by default in this web space here. You can also see that I have artboards checked. So Photoshop is assuming that if we're going to work on the web, we're going to want to work with artboards. Whereas if we chose print, that artboards would not be checked. And the default is inches instead of pixels. So going back to web, and of course I have control over all of this. I can change this to anything that I want. We're gonna leave the default resolution of 72 pixels per inch because we are doing things that are going on the web. And if I wanted to change this, let's just say that I wanna do an image for Instagram, that would be 1080 by 1080. I can just type that in here. And when I'm happy, just go ahead and click create and Photoshop creates an image that's 1080 by 1080. And it's on something called an artboard. Artboards are fairly new in Photoshop. They've been around for a few years now. And so you may never have come across them in here. If you've used Illustrator, you will be familiar with artboards in Illustrator. They behave a little bit differently here inside of Adobe Photoshop. And I want to tell you more about artboards and what you can do with them and how to use them. Artboards here inside of Photoshop allow us to create 
different work surfaces for different projects inside of the same file. In the last clip, we started with one artboard that's 1080 by 1080 for Instagram. If I want to continue to add other artboards, I can create more of the same size or different sizes for different platforms. Over in my toolbar, if I right click on my move tool, you can see that I have an artboard tool. When I choose my artboard tool, I get handles around the artboard. This allows me to resize my artboard if I want to. I'm gonna undo that, Command or Control Z. I can also click on the plus sign and I can create a second artboard. When the artboard properties pop up, I can then type in different dimensions if I want to. So let's create an artboard for Twitter. 1024 PX by 512 PX. And now I have another artboard for Twitter. And if I want to rename these, just like a layer, I can go ahead and rename these. I can double click on Artboard 2 and I can call it Twitter. I can double click on Artboard 1 and I can call it Instagram. I can also create a new artboard from the Layers Flyout menu. I can come over here and choose New Artboard. It's going to bring up a little dialog box. I can give it a name if I'd like. So let's make this one Pinterest. And again, I can come down here and type in the size. So I'm going to do 735 by 1102 and choose OK. And now it's created yet a third artboard for me. And if I zoom out, you can see them all here. Another way to duplicate artboards with your artboard tool selected, you can grab an artboard. In this case, I'm going to grab the Pinterest artboard over in my layers panel, drag and drop it onto the new layer icon, and it creates a duplicate copy. So now I have more than one. We can also see that each artboard is kind of like a group unto its own. So if I start adding layers, each artboard is going to have its own layers. Let's just take a look at that. Here I have some graphics to work with on my artboards and I'll drag one out to the Instagram artboard. I'm going to grab another one out to my Twitter artboard and you can see that that layer gets created underneath of the Twitter artboard. And let's do another one on one of these Pinterest artboards and that one I didn't get quite right. We'll move that over. And so now that layer is on top of the Pinterest artboard. And we can go ahead and develop each one of these as separate images. And later on, I'm going to show you how to save them all out as separate images. Let's take a look at a document that is already in progress. I have several artboards and each artboard has several layers and groups of layers. My layers panel starts to get fairly confusing. To visually declutter the layers panel a little bit so that it's not so confusing to look at, I can colorize the individual artboards, individual layers, and layer groups. To do that, all I need to do is right click. So right clicking on this Facebook artboard, at the bottom of the list here, I have colors and I'm gonna change it to red. I have more colors than what you can see. I apologize for that. So I'm gonna change the next Facebook one to red as well. And then we'll make Twitter a violet color and both Twitters can become violet. So now if I close these guys all up, you can see it's a little less confusing. And then I can give the Instagram artboards their own color as well. Let's take a look at some of the templates that Photoshop has given us to work with. Inside of the new document window, I can see that I have a few. One zigzag social media set, botanical social media set. I have some more if I go under mobile. In mobile, I've got the bold social media set. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up this bold social media set. And I'm also going to 
open up the zigzag social media set and we'll take a look at both of these if you're looking for more options and you go out to stock.adobe.com you can search on Adobe stock for yet more templates and what I've done here is typed in social media templates and from the drop down I've chosen templates in the filters I've chosen Photoshop and you can see that they've given me quite a selection to choose from and some of them are free so this is the free template that we just opened up with inside of Photoshop and they will say free next to them when they are free and you can quickly and easily download these or license them and they will show up inside of your CC libraries let's go back into Photoshop and take a look at these templates this first template here has a lot of different artboards for different sizes to create social media graphics and you can see that they're all labeled here we can make this a little bit bigger so we can read them and they're clearly labeled for each social media app that they're intended for it can be a little overwhelming so let's say that we just want to take a look at the Instagram ones for now what I can do is turn off the eyeballs and a quick easy way to do that is just click and drag to turn off all the other eyeballs when I want to turn them back on I can do the same thing just click and drag so I don't need to click each one individually and now I can go ahead and zoom in on these guys I'm using the keyboard shortcut spacebar plus control to zoom in and I can now see these guys nice and big I'm gonna go ahead and click on the 1080 by 1080 artboard so that I can see the layers inside so we have a layer full of text which I can turn on and off or delete and some design elements and a solid colored background you can use any of these elements that you'd like and if you don't want to use any of them you can just throw them all away and start with your own images so if I've decided this isn't gonna work for me I can throw them in the trash and I can come over here and say I really want to work with this image and go ahead and bring it in and then I can figure out whatever it is that I want to do with it so all I'm doing is holding down the shift key and dragging one of the corners to make it larger to fit in there while I'm placing it and hit enter or return when you're done and it's placed here inside of the artboard now you can see that if I want to do the same thing over here on this other artboard which has a different aspect ratio that photo is not gonna fit quite as well if you just click on one layer and hold down the shift key and click on another layer the bottom layer you can throw all those layers away I can pull this image out again and you can see it's not going to fit quite the same way I can still make it bigger but now I'm losing part of my image so what can we do to solve some of these problems that's what we're going to talk about next but before we jump over there let's take a look at this other template that we've opened up and you can see this template is doing the same size so this might be several different campaigns that you're going to post to Instagram each artboard is the same size but you can go ahead and create different images on top of each artboard and again it's a great place to start you can create your own template from it so let's take a look and see how we can overcome some of the challenges that face us when using images on different sized social media campaigns in this module we explore the new document interface how to create a new Photoshop document including documents specifically for web and mobile we also took a look at how to create artboards and managing our layers within those artboards and where we can find more Adobe stock social media templates on the Adobe stock website in the next module we're going to explore how we can make our images fit within the constraints of our social media templates and artboards let's take a look at how we can create some backgrounds and prepare our photos inside of Photoshop for our social media graphics we're going to go ahead and start this module off by taking a look at content aware crop and scale 
we need to fit our images within the specified sizes for our social media. We'll look at moving parts of an image to make room for type. How do we create and use gradients? Maybe we want to add some borders and creating patterns inside of Adobe Capture, which is a mobile app. Let's get started by taking a look at Content Aware Crop. So let's take a look and see what we're going to recreate. Here I have a few social media graphics and I have a square or a very small rectangle format and then I have a longer rectangle format and I'm using the same images for both. So how can I get my images to work for both formats? I happen to have these images inside of my CC libraries. So here I have the image of the two young girls putting their arms up and I have the donut image. But let's just take a look over here. So they work great in the square or the shorter rectangle, but they don't work so well as the longer rectangle. So how did I get them to work inside of this format? Well, I use something called Content Aware Crop, and I'm going to go ahead and double click to open up each one of these images into their own file in Photoshop. I can't use Content Aware Crop inside of a file that contains artboards. It's not going to work. So I'm going to have to work on these two images individually. I'm going to just grab the Crop tool and up in my Options bar, I'm going to turn on Content Aware. I can slide the crop box to the right. If I hit enter or return on my keyboard, Photoshop is going to do all of the hard work for me. And once it's complete, you can see that parts of the image are a little strange. I have some cloned looking clouds and a cloned looking background, but I think this will probably be okay for what we're going to use it for. With my move tool, I'm just going to go ahead and drag it back into the library so that I have a different version of this image that I can use. And you can see it popped up right there. I'm now going to close it. I don't need to save this. I'm going to do the same thing with my donut image. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit, grab my crop tool, and I need to add some extra space over on the right side for my words. So again, content aware, hit enter or return on the keyboard to accept it, and it's done. And I'm going to do the same thing by dragging this one into my library as well. So now I have both of my new images inside of my library and I can go ahead and bring them into a blank template. I'm going to grab the long image of the donut and go ahead and place it in here. And then I'm going to grab the long image of this other one here and go ahead and place it. And we'll get these all sorted out in a second. And I'm also going to use the original image in these other ones. So as I'm placing it, it's giving me control handles and it's not really showing me what I'm able to do. I'm just kind of guessing here, but I can move everything around later on. And I know this one, we're gonna wind up cropping this way. So I can get these all settled in there. Let's close this up and I'm gonna move this one over where it belongs. I do know I want it bigger. So I'm doing a Commander Control T, whoops, and then I can make it bigger. Of course, it went a little crazy on me here. Get it back in here so we can see it on the screen. We'd like it to look something like that. And then we'll be adding all of the other pieces and parts to our social media graphics. Let's take a look at Content Aware Move. For our next social media image, we're going to take the image of the girl jumping and we want to make sure that she's off to the edge. So we have plenty of room in the middle for our message. So I'm going to start by opening her up in her own file and I'm going to grab my content aware move tool. And with this tool, I can make a selection. You can also go ahead and make a selection with any other tool, but I just want you to know that you want to make sure that you have some edges of the background in your selection. You don't want a tightly cropped selection. I want to do this non-destructively, so I'm going to go ahead and add a blank layer, double click on that layer, and call it Move, 
And up in my options bar, I want to make sure that I have sample all layers selected. That way, it can use this blank layer to move her over. I will place my cursor inside and just slide her off to the left and she will move over once I hit enter or return on the keyboard. There's also a little check mark at the top of the screen you can use. And just like magic, she's out of the way. I do seem to have run into some problems here. It cut off her hand, but everything else looks okay. And sometimes that happens. So we can just try again. I think what I'll do is I'll make a bigger area around her hand for my selection and I can step back through in my history and I'm going to go back to the content aware move where I have my selection. To add to my selection, I can just hold down my shift key. I'm just going to give some more space around that hand and hopefully it'll work a little bit better this time. I need to create that new layer, go ahead and call it move, and I accidentally clicked on my image and lost my selection, it's okay. You can do a Control Z or Command Z to get that back, and I'm just gonna move her off to the left-hand side. So let's try this again. And this time, that little extra space made all the difference and it worked perfectly. So Command or Control D to deselect, and now I have my image just the way I want it. I can go ahead and select both of the layers and you can right click and choose convert to smart object. This is now a single image and I can go ahead and drop this into my libraries and I'll have it to be able to use in my social media template. So here are my social media template I'm going to drop it into the square version of Instagram first. And again, Photoshop's not really cooperating and showing me what I want. But once I get it set in there, I need to use switch to my move tool and move it over. Now it seems to be working the way I want it to. I'm going to do the same thing here in the rectangle version. And I want to make sure that this one goes all the way across the page. And this one, she needs to move down just a little bit. I can either redo exactly what we just did, or I can go ahead and do a content aware crop on that same image to give it a little bit more room and a little bit more width. Let's go ahead and do that content aware crop. If I double click on this image, it was a smart object and I can make it a little bit smaller here go ahead and grab my crop tool and I'm going to go ahead and drag this out just a little bit. That should be enough to take care of this. I have content aware on hit enter and it didn't quite like what we did because I was in the wrong layer. So you can see the mistake that I made. I did content aware crop and I had this layer selected. So let's try that again. I'm going to go ahead and do a command or control Z. Make sure I choose my background layer. And I'm going to try this one more time. And that looks pretty good. This is a smart object. I'm working in a file called move.psb. So if I save this and I close it up, when I come back here, it's been updated. I can actually make it a little bit smaller. So I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so that it's sitting the way I want inside of my image here. And let's go ahead and make sure, cause this one was updated as well. And we'll just slide that one right over. And there we have it, content aware move. And in this case, we use both content aware move and content aware crop to make our image fit the way we wanted it to. Let's talk about gradients, how to use them and how to create them here inside of Photoshop. If we take a look at this social media image, I have a shape that I've created and I've used a gradient inside of the shape. This particular gradient is called a radial gradient because it's circular like the shape. I want to show you how to create gradients in a blank document. Here I have a blank document and I just wanna show you how gradients work in general. We have a gradient tool. I'm going to choose my gradient tool and up in the options bar, you can see that there is a little drop down that gives me a bunch of preset gradients that Photoshop has created for us. 
And the first one, which is the one that I tend to use the most, is foreground to background color. It's taking my current foreground color, which is orange, and my current background color, which is white, and creating a gradient. To create a gradient, I simply click and drag, and I draw a line across my document. If I want that gradient to go up and down, I can do it again. This time I'm holding my shift key to make sure I draw a straight line. And again, I have a gradient, or I can go sideways. Just so you know, the gradient happens along the line. So if I make a really long line, I'm not gonna have very much pure white and pure orange. I'm gonna have a lot of gradient. If I make a very short line, I'm gonna have a very tight gradient and a lot of white and a lot of orange. So let's take a look and see how we can customize this gradient. If I simply click up in the options bar, I get my gradient editor and I have something called color stops here. They look like little houses at the ends of the gradient, and I can click on those guys and change their color. So if I wanna get a deeper orange, I can change this, make it a deeper orange, and then come over to the white color stop and change that color as well. I'm going to make this more of a bright yellow. Now I have a new gradient. Let's say that I wanted to add some more colors. I can click right underneath the gradient and it's going to add some color stops. I'm gonna add two of them and then I simply click on those stops and again, I can change the color. So I can introduce other colors and make the gradient as complicated or as simple as I'd like. So if I've decided that's a little bit too much, I can then pull those color stops off and they will go away. So I have my new gradient. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I'm going to get rid of this background layer just by going back in my history up to new and undoing all of that stuff that I've done. Now I wanna create that shape that we were working with. I'm gonna to go to our shape tools and choose the polygon tool. Up in my options bar, I'm making sure that my polygon is set to shape and I'm going to click on the gear icon. Inside of the gear, I can choose star so that I get a star instead of a regular polygon. And my sides are indented by 10%. A regular star would be 50%. I've also set the sides to 30. So now I can come out and I can drag out this shape and you can see it gets filled with my foreground color place it more in the middle so we can see it. I need to continue with my shape tool in order to change the fill color. So I've switched to my move tool, but if I go back to my shape tool, I can access that stuff again. And up here in the options bar under fill, I can choose how I want it to be filled. And you can see that right now I have no stroke, a solid fill, but I'm gonna change my fill to a gradient fill. And I can come in here, and grab a gradient. If I come down, I can see the gradient that I created is not actually in here for me to select. But what I can do is if I go back to my gradient tool, there's the gradient that I created. It is still there. So I can save this by clicking on this little gear icon. I can choose new gradient. I can give it a name if I'd like. I'm gonna call this sunset and click okay and then it gets saved here in my gradient list. Now, if I go back to my polygon tool and back up to my fill, if I scroll down, there's that new gradient that I selected and I can apply it. However, I don't want this to be linear. I have options. I want this to be radial. So I'm going to choose it as a radial gradient. This little icon here that's going to allow me to reverse it, which is exactly what I want, so I've reversed it, and now this image looks exactly how I want. I'm gonna go ahead and click off. This green line is just a little helper to be able to show you that it, this is a path, it's a vector graphic. It doesn't really exist. If I grab my move tool, you can see that that line goes away. In my social media graphic, this image also has a drop shadow. So let's go ahead and add a drop shadow. At the bottom of my layers panel, I can click on the FX button and choose drop shadow. And it gives me this dialog box, it's in the way. So I'm going to move it off to the side a little bit so I can see what's happening over here. 
and then I can come in and play with the sliders and make any changes that I'd like with my drop shadow. And the only thing I'm going to do is change my global light. I'm happy with that. I'm going to click OK. And now I have an image that looks a lot like this image that I used in my social media graphic. So the last step is so that I can use this over and over, I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop this image into my library. And now I have it so I can place it in a graphic later on. Let's talk about how we can create borders inside of Photoshop. Here inside of this social media image, I have a couple of borders. I have a border around my photo and I have a border around the whole image. Those are two different techniques that I'd like to show you. And we'll go ahead and do it right in our social media template. I'm going to start by pulling out the image and I want to place her. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter return to accept that. But I want her to fit in a square inside of our image. And to do this non-destructively, I'm going to go ahead and create a selection with my rectangular marquee tool. If I hold down my shift key, I get a perfect square. And once I have that square, I can move it around. I can either nudge with my arrow keys or just click and drag. And I want it non-destructive, meaning that I don't want to actually cut any pixels out. And because I pulled her out from the CC library, Photoshop is not going to allow me to make any changes to the pixels anyway. If we come over and find her in our layers, you can see that there's a little cloud icon. So I can't adjust anything anyway because it's linked from our library. However, I could right click and choose to embed this content and then I wouldn't have to worry about it. But I'm going to use a layer mask. At the bottom of my layers panel, I have a little icon, kind of looks like a front loader washing machine. You can click on that and it takes your selection and turns it into a layer mask. So it's hiding those areas. What I'd like to do is give her a border. And if I click on the little FX button here, I can choose stroke. The stroke dialog box pops up. The color's white, so I can't see what's happening. Just so you can see what's happening, I'm going to make this black. And I can increase or decrease the size of my stroke. I'm going to set that back to white. And I'm going to add a drop shadow so that we can see the overlay and click OK. Now I want to rotate her, so Command or Control T, and I'm just going to rotate it a little bit. Hit enter to accept that. I'm going to go ahead and add the background in here that we're going to use just so we can see what we're working on. So back in my library, I'm going to choose this background and I want to make this quite a bit bigger. So holding down my shift key, I can drag it out and it's going to look something like this and hit enter and then rearrange my layers so that this goes underneath of the current layer that we're working on here. So now I can see that she's sitting on top. And I'd like to add a border all the way around, a white border. There's a lot of different ways of making borders inside of Photoshop. One of my personal favorite ways is to use our shape tools. If I take a rectangle tool, I can simply draw out a rectangle. Now remember, that weird green line doesn't really exist. It's just a visual helper. So I'm going to zoom in on this so we can see what we're working with here. If we look at our properties, you can see that it's filled with that orange. I don't want to fill, so I'm going to choose the red slash for none, but I do want a stroke. And I'm going to make a white stroke, but I want it to be a little bit thicker than one pixel. And again, it's hard to see because of that green line. So once I'm done, I switch to my move tool and you can see now I have a border that goes all the way around. And again, it's up here. We simply can't see it because it's white on white, but we'll go ahead and finish this up by creating a pattern in capture. I'd like to show you how to use Adobe capture. 
It's a mobile app and you can use it on your phone or your iPad. It's compatible with both Android and iOS. Here's an image of my phone. Click on Adobe Capture and you can see that I have some patterns in here. And if I scroll through here, Capture has lots of different things that we can create. We can create shapes, which will basically turn anything that we point the camera to into a vector graphic. We can take images of type and run it through the filter in here to see if we can figure out what typeface or font that type is. We can create colors, materials, patterns, brushes, etc. What we want to look at right now is patterns. And you can see at the bottom, I can use an image that's already on my phone or I can use my camera. And now I'm pointing my camera at my computer and it's giving me a pattern. I can point this at whatever I'd like. If I switch to my desk, here's a glass of water on my desk. I can get some cool patterns and as I move it around, it's creating a different kind of pattern. I'm gonna point it over here to my iPad. The parts inside of the triangle are what create the pattern. I just tap to freeze and I can change the pattern by clicking in the upper right corner. I can change how the pattern is going to look as I scroll through these. Super fun, super easy. I think I like that really dark one. And then click on the little check box. I'm going to choose save. On the save screen, I can choose which CC library to save it to. I'm going to save it into our social media graphics library. I can even create a new library, but we'll save it in this one. And when I choose save, it's saved. Now, if we get out of this, let's go take a look at it inside of Photoshop. If I open up my libraries, I can see my pattern. And if I click on the pattern, it automatically creates a new pattern fill layer. And I can see the pattern on my artboard and I can choose how I'd like to scale it. And I think I'm just going to try and scale it to 12%. That looks pretty good. And if I close this up, I have my new pattern and I can simply bring it below our border. And this is looking pretty good. I have some more work to do if I wanna include my autumn leaves. And let's just take care of that really quickly. I'm going to hold down my Alter Option key and turn off the eyeballs for every other layer. And I'm going to make a quick selection of my autumn leaves. If I come up to my Select menu, I can choose Select Subject. And I'm going to add a layer mask on this to hide the background. And then I can turn my other layers back on, bring my autumn leaves back up, so it's on top of my photo layer and I have a little bit of cleanup that I need to do inside of the autumn leaves, but that's looking pretty good. The last part of this is to pull out that gradient shape that we created and I can resize it and place it right where I need it. And now this is looking pretty close to our original social media graphics image. In this module, I showed you how we could use Content-Aware Crop to crop and scale parts of our images. We also moved parts of images using the Content-Aware Move tool, and I showed you how to create custom gradients. We added some borders, and I introduced you to Adobe Capture, the mobile app. In our next module, we'll take a look at how to add type. Hi, this is Melissa Picone, and let's talk about how we work with type in Photoshop. In this module, I'm going to show you how we can create some text that we can read by creating some shapes in the background. We're going to look for new fonts with Adobe Type Kit. We're going to create and format point and paragraph type. And we're going to take a look at layer styles and how they work with text. Here inside of my completed graphics, you can see that I have areas of type. If we take a look at this Facebook square image here, you can see there's a big black area for our type to sit on top of. And if we look at Instagram, we have a rounded rectangle that we're gonna use. If we slide on over, we also have that same shape for this Twitter rectangle here. And we have a rectangle in the Instagram version, 
that has its opacity reduced. And then on the Instagram version with the fall leaves, we have a feathered out circular shape where we've also lowered the opacity. So let's take a look and see how to create these areas so that we can read our type. If we jump to our working file here, I'm gonna start with this Facebook image. I'm gonna make it nice and big so we can kind of see what we're working with here. And I wanna use a shape. So I'm gonna come into my shapes over here and choose custom shape tool. When I come up into my options bar, I have options for my custom shapes. These are the default custom shapes that Adobe is giving you, but there's more. If you click on the gear icon, you can see that there's all kinds of shapes that we can add. You can create your own shapes and you can find more shapes out online. So we're just gonna use this little shape here and I select it and then I'm gonna drag out a version of the shape. I need it to be pretty big and if I don't get it exactly right away, that's okay. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit and switch to my move tool so that I can resize it. So Command or Control T and I'm just gonna pull it up, make it a little bit skinnier, move it over. I'm nudging with my arrow keys. I need to change the color. I want this to be black. So I'm gonna go back to my shape tool. Yes, I want to apply the transformation and up in the options bar, I'm gonna change the fill color to black. So that looks pretty good. Back to my move tool. I'm gonna to zoom out a little bit and I wanna be able to see our other area over here. I'm going to click on that object and if I hold down the Alt or Option key, my cursor changes into these double arrows and I can simply drag a copy over to our other little graphic and that works pretty well. And so now on this graphic for Twitter, I have a little more room. I can move those girls over just a little bit, maybe nudge them with my arrow keys to get them exactly in place where I want them. So that was pretty easy. Let's go ahead and take a look at this other Instagram image with our girl jumping. I'm gonna drag out a rectangle. I wanna take a look in the properties panel here. This is how I'm going to create my rounded corners. So I'm gonna just try 30 pixels and see how that works. That looks pretty good, maybe a little bit more, maybe we'll do 50 pixels. And I'm just gonna hit tab. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and change the color of this guy. And up in the options bar, I'm gonna make it white and then grab my move tool to get rid of that green line. So it looks pretty good. I want my girl to be on top of this. So how am I going to accomplish that? Well, I need to make a selection of her. And the quickest and easiest way to do that is to use our new select subject. Over in my layers panel, my layers are crazy because I've got all these artboards that I'm working with. At the top of the layers panel, I can choose to look at just the artboard layers, which is what I want. So now I'm just looking at these layers in our artboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off this rectangle temporarily and select our quick selection tool. When I select the quick selection tool, I need to make sure I'm on the right layer, so I wanna be on our move layer here. I have a button that says select subject. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that, and it's going to select the main subject in this image, which is our girl. And it did a pretty good job. It missed some of the areas. So really quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and click on select and mask. And I'm not going to explain a whole lot what I'm doing in here because this is explained on other videos. There's another course using Adobe Stock Images where I walk through the techniques that I'm using here. And we only really care about this one side of her. So I'm going to zoom in here. I'm just painting around her using this brush called the Refine Edge Brush. And I wanna get rid of all that blue. It's not cooperating, so I'm gonna to switch to a regular brush tool and then I can come in here. I need to actually switch this. So if I hold down my Alter Option key, 
I can just come in and kind of erase this blue. And all I care about are the parts that are going to be overlapping that white piece. It doesn't have to be a perfect selection. So I'm just going to quickly kind of go through this again, holding down my alter option key so that I can get rid of some of those fuzzy blue parts. And I think that's good enough. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I want to basically copy her to a new layer so that she can sit on top of that rectangle. And to do that, I have a keyboard shortcut. It's Command or Control J. And I jumped her to a new layer. And then I can place the rectangle underneath of her. And now she's sitting on top of that rectangle. And we're basically going to do the same thing over here. I'm just going to draw out a rectangle. And I want this rectangle to have regular corners, but I want it to be transparent. So what I did was I came up to the opacity and I simply lowered the opacity of this layer. And now I can see the background underneath. And then I did the same thing to get her cut out to put her on top of this opaque rectangle. So the last piece of this is this guy right here. And I'm just going to zoom in. And I want to create a space over here that we can put text on top of. I'm going to start with a blank layer. I'm going to click on the Create New Layer icon at the bottom of the Layers panel. And I want to fill this layer with white. My keyboard shortcuts to do that because my white is currently my background color, I can on the Mac hold down Command Delete and on the PC that would be Control Backspace and it's now filled with white. I'm going to come up and grab my elliptical marquee tool and I'm going to drag out a circular area and then I'm going to add a layer mask. The reason I'm doing it this way is because I can visually see my feather. Now on my layer mask, if I double click on that mask, I get a mask properties panel that pops up and you can see I have a slider for feather. So I can go ahead and feather this area. And this is really the only way to do this to be able to see what you're doing. There's other ways to create feathers, but you're not getting visual real time feedback when you're doing it. You're kind of guessing at what it's going to look like. So I think that looks pretty good and I can always come in and change it again later if I want to. And in here I also have density so I can go ahead and change the density. That's actually not doing what I want. So I'm going to put that back. I'm going to close this up and what I'm going to do is lower the opacity of this layer. So now I have kind of a lightened nice feathered area that I can place text in. So now let's take a look at how we can use Adobe Typekit and find some cool fonts that we can add to our social media graphics. I want to introduce you to Adobe Typekit. It's a service that's included with your subscription to Creative Cloud. And I'm going to start by adding some text to my images. I'm going to click on the type tool, click and type in some words. I'm going to type in say 50% and I'm going to switch over to my move tool so that I can move it in place. And I want to open up my character panel. Remember all of your panels are located up under the window menu if you don't see your character panel. And here in my character panel, I have a lot of information and we're going to cover all of this. But for now, I want to talk about this first section here, this is the name of the font that I'm using, Filson Soft. And if I click on the down arrow, you can see that it's going to give me a list of all of my fonts. I have a lot of fonts installed. If I want to find some different fonts, I have this Add Fonts from Type Kit. And there's a little green button over here. When I click on this green button, you can see that it opens up in a new browser. I'm on the Adobe Type Kit website. I'm logged into Creative Cloud so it knows who I am. My picture's up in the upper right hand corner. I can go ahead and search. So if I'm not sure what I'm looking for, I can search by style. Let's say that I'd like to search for a script font. I can click on that button there and it's going to return some script fonts. I can also choose if I want it to be a heading or a paragraph, I'll say heading. And I can type in my own text. So let's say that I want it to say, I want to see what it's going to look like when I type in save 50%. And I can scroll through and I can go to the next page. I already know the fonts 
that I'm using and we can search for those directly at the top of the screen I can type in I'm using a font called Spumante and if I type that in it will return Spumante if I click on Spumante it'll show me all of the fonts that are available to me they do have premium fonts that you have to pay for but most of the fonts that you're going to use are going to be free and you can see that I already have a couple of these fonts synced where it says unsync and the ones that are not synced I could just click the sync button to go ahead and sync them and it happens super fast and as soon as you hit sync they're going to be available to you inside of Photoshop these fonts will also actually be available to you in any application you're not limited to using them in just your Adobe application so if you wanted to use them inside of a Word document you can they actually get installed on your computer for you to use the other font that I'm using is called Hucklebuck and I can click on Hucklebuck and same thing you can see that I have it synced because mine says unsync now one thing you should know is that you can only have up to a hundred fonts synced and each version of the font is one font so if there's 16 versions of a font then that's going to be 16 fonts if we want to take a look I can explain this a little bit better you can see that my usage I have 99 fonts out of a hundred synced so let's go back into Photoshop and I will show you how to use these fonts so again back from the drop down list you can see that the fonts all have different icons TK means that it is a typekit font and I have filters up here if I want to look at just my typekit fonts I can click on TK and see just those typekit fonts so I'm going to go ahead and take a look at Hucklebuck and Spumante and I think I want to use Spumante on this one and then I can change the size so I have a little drop down here and I can just kind of guess at the size that I want to use I can also actually close this up and do a transform so command or control T and I can drag it out until it's the size that I want it to be hit enter or return on the keyboard so now that we've added some fonts from Adobe type kit let's take a look at how to create and format our type in this clip I want to show you how we can create and format our type so we've already created a single line of type and that's called point type when we just click with the type tool to create one line of type we can also create paragraph type and to create a paragraph of type we want to drag out a box and in here I'm going to type in some text and I want this text to go above and below our 50% off text and to do that I'm going to go back to my move tool and open up my character panel I'm going to leave this open over here so that we can see it and there's a whole lot of stuff going on in here so I have the name of my font it's regular as opposed to bold or italic I have the size and then to the right of the size this is called the letting it's called letting because back when they invented the printing press they actually used real bars of lead to separate the text you may know this as line spacing if I place my cursor over the little icon you can see the little two A's there I get what's called a scrubby slider so it's a finger with a two-headed arrow and I can just click and drag and it's going to allow me to visually set the letting for this type and I can then move it around and that actually looks pretty good so I've created enough spacing to fit that save 50% off in between those two lines of text let's go ahead and add some text to our other artboards for this one we're going to go ahead and use a combination of point type and paragraph type I'm going to start off with some point type I'm just going to click and type in the word winners and my type came in in all caps I want you to know that everything inside of the characters panel is sticky which means that whatever settings I have they're going to stay that way until the next time I go in and change them so right now I have this all caps icon selected and I need to click on that to make that not all caps I want to use Hucklebuff instead of having to go through that whole list 
I can just go ahead and start typing HU and it brings up Hucklebuck. There it is. And I'm going to go ahead and increase the size. I'm just kind of guessing here. That actually looks pretty good. I can even go a little bit bigger. Let's do 72 points. And now I want to add some paragraph text underneath. So I'm going to grab that type tool again. And this time I'm going to drag out a box. And I just happen to have my text in my clipboard. So I'm going to go ahead and paste it. It is the wrong font. And so I'm going to change this to another Typekit font that I've downloaded. It's called Urbana, Urbana Light. And I need to have it selected. And then it should work. There we go. And I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger, maybe 30 points, maybe not quite that big. Let's try 24 points. I think that looks a little bit better. And I'm going to place this right up here. And actually, I don't need the word never or quit. So we'll get rid of those words because those are going to be the same format as this winner's one. Add the word never and switch. And I'm going to click again and type in the word quit. And I'm going to go ahead and format this. So one last thing I want to show you in here is if we zoom in on this word never, you can see that the N and the E are not touching, but the rest of my letters are touching. So I can change this. If I grab my type tool again, I need to get my cursor right in between those letters. Here inside of my character panel, we have this little icon, the V slash A. This is for kerning. And for kerning, we can kern between two letters. This is something that you would only do in titles. You wouldn't really do this inside of paragraph. It would take way too much time. But I can click and drag. I've got that scrubby slider. And I'm just going to take it to the left a little bit so that those two letters meet up. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see that. And let's move on to the next one. On this last one, we're going to go ahead and create some paragraph type and just format the different lines inside of that whole paragraph. So I'm going to go ahead and drag this out. And I'm simply going to type eat more donuts. And what I want to happen is I want the donuts to be really big and I want the eat more to be a little bit smaller. I'm going to increase the size of the donuts. Let's try 150 and see how that looks. That's not too bad. And I need to make my text box larger to accommodate that giant text that I created. And then the eat more, we can make it a little bit smaller. I think I'm going to go for 48. And then we can change the letting between the two so that they sit better. And let's go for 125 points here. See how that looks. That looks pretty good. And if you wanted to change the alignment, so right now it's centered, you can always come up into the options bar. And you can see that I've got left align, center, et cetera. I can also change that inside of my paragraph panel if I want to. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to leave it just like this. And I'm going to go ahead and fill out the text in our other graphics. And we'll come back in the next clip and talk about how we can use layer styles to make the text look more interesting. In this clip, we're going to talk about layer styles and how we can make our type look a little bit more interesting. Here in this graphic, we have this text and maybe we want it to blend in a little bit better with the background instead of being so white and just sitting on top. If I select the text so I can see the layer here in my layers panel, I can play with layer blend modes. In my layer blend modes, when I'm working with white, I have some choices. I can try some different blend modes. I can try lighten. It didn't actually make a difference. Screen didn't make a difference. So let's come down to overlay and soft light. Overlay, it kind of looks like the text is burned into the wood. And if I choose soft light, it's not quite as dramatic, but it's harder to read. So I think I actually like the overlay. And then I can go ahead and play with the opacity to make it look more like it's blended into the wood. So using layer blend modes is one way to make your text blend in with the background and look a little bit more interesting. Here in this graphic, we have some text that's in two separate layers. So if I look at my layers panel, I've got the save 50% and the learn for less. I want to put these into a group. I'm going to apply what's called a layer style 
to make this text look a little bit more interesting. And I want it to go on both layers. So instead of having to apply the layer style separately to each layers, it's just easier if I put them in a group. So with my save 50% copy layer selected, if I hold down the shift key and click on the learn for less layer, I have them both selected. Then I can click on the group icon, which basically is the folder icon at the bottom of the layers panel, and it puts it in a group. I'm gonna rename the group type so that I know what I'm working with. In the styles panel, I'm gonna take a look and see what options I have. I've already loaded up some text style, and if you go to the flyout menu, you can see that Photoshop is giving you a bunch of presets that you can use. So I've loaded up the text effects to and text effects. And I can come in here and I can kind of scroll through. You can see some of them are really crazy and you may never use them. But basically what you do is if you just click on one of the buttons, it's going to apply those layer styles. And I can try some different ones. Bright red bevel. That one's not too, too bad. Uh, some of them are really strange and you know, they're not going to work for me. So I'm going to stick with the red bevel. And if I come up in the layer, you can see all the effects that were used to create this style. And I can double click on any of these to open up the controls and make any changes that I might want to make. So of course, this is right smack in the middle of my text. If I slide it over a little bit, I can change the size. I can soften it up a little bit. I can move these sliders around and change it to however I'd like. I'm going to go ahead and click OK on that. That's how you can apply layer styles to make your text look a little bit more interesting. You can also create your own styles and you can find styles that other people have created online. For this text here, I'd like to put a gradient inside of the text and make it look a little bit more interesting. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and grab my gradient tool and create a gradient. I still have the old gradient that we created earlier. I'm going to move this over. I'm actually going to go ahead and add a red color to our gradient. So we have three colors. Click in the stop and let's make it a little bit more red. Click OK. That looks pretty cool. I'm going to click OK. So I need to switch to my move tool to be able to click on the text to have it show up inside of the layers. So now that I can see my layers, again, I'm going to combine these two layers into their own group because I want to have the gradient go across both of those. Rename this to text. I'm going to use what's called a clipping mask. So I'm going to create a new blank layer, grab that gradient tool, and I'm just going to go ahead and create a gradient. Now it's covering up everything and I only want it to show up in the letters. So what I can do is if I right click on layer three, I can create a clipping mask. So that gradient only shows up inside of that group. Now it's still kind of hard to see. So what I'd like to do is add some sort of kind of dark edge around it, not necessarily a stroke. So I'm going to come down into effects and I'm going to choose an outer glow. And by default, the outer glow is white. Well, I already have white. That's not going to work for me. So I'm actually going to customize this so it works for me. So instead of having white, I'm going to make this black. And instead of having screen, I'm going to set this to multiply to make it a little bit darker. And it, you can see how it's created that dark edge. And then I can change the size and I can change the spread until it looks good. And I think that looks pretty good. It makes it pop a little bit more. And I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And now I have some text that's filled with a gradient and kind of pops off the page a little bit. This last one is going to be a little bit tricky. What I'd like to happen is the words winners, never, and quit to actually show the background. And to do that, I have to make selections and create layer masks. Luckily for us, it's pretty easy to create a selection from a layer. If you just hold down Command or Control and you mouse over the layer icon. So you can see I moused over the T, which is the layer icon for winners. And I get this hand that kind of has a little miniature marching ants box. If I go ahead and click on that, that makes a selection. 
Well, I need to get never and quit as part of my selection too. So I need to add to my selection. So again, if I'm over the never icon and I hold down the command or control key plus the shift key, notice I get a little plus sign in there, okay? So I've got command or control plus shift and click. I've just added to the selection. Same thing with quit. Commander control plus shift. And now I have three words selected. Down on my shape one copy, what I want to happen is I'm basically poking a hole through that using a layer mask. Remember, all non destructive. So at the bottom of the layers panel, if I click on the new layer mask icon, it creates a new layer mask. Unfortunately, it did it in reverse, but that's okay. Quick, easy keyboard shortcut, Command or Control I to invert, will invert that layer mask. Now, if I simply turn off the eyeball for the word winners, never, and quit, I can see through to our background. To finish up our graphics, I'm simply going to double click on the hand tool so that we can see everything. And the only thing that's missing now is maybe our logo. So if I go to my libraries, if you have a logo that you want to add, you can just drag that logo out and place it wherever it needs to go on your images and they're set and we're ready to save them for use on the web. Let me just place this guy here. And I think I actually want it to go down in this corner. I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit smaller and let's get them saved. In this module, we took a look at how to create text using boxes in the background and how to access and use Adobe Typekit fonts. We created and formatted point and paragraph type, and we used layer styles for special effects with type. In the next module, we're going to take a look at how to save your images. Hi, this is Melissa Bacone. Let's talk about how to save your images inside of Photoshop. In this module, we're going to define the various file formats that we can use when saving images for the web. I'm going to show you different ways that you can save your images and how to share your images directly to social media sites right from within Photoshop. We're going to save files locally and in your CC libraries when we go ahead and save custom templates for you to use in the future. Let's start by taking a look at different file formats and what our options are. We can save images as JPEG, GIF, or ping. A JPEG consists of millions of colors and has what's called a lossy compression. It's great for photographs. It's going to create a nice, small, compact image, and it's going to maintain all those great colors inside of our images. JPEG is actually what we're going to use for our graphics. But just so you understand what the other ones are, let's go ahead and talk about the other options as well. A GIF file can be between 2 and 256 colors. You can have one color that's transparent. That's not really helpful. Back when GIF was one of our only options, we kind of used that one color of transparency. The cool thing that GIF can do is it can be animated. So if you're doing anything with animation, you can create an animated GIF and you can do that inside of Photoshop. Another option is to save as a ping file. And we have different kinds of ping files. We can have a ping 8, a ping 24, and a ping 32. Basically, a ping file is going to give us the option to have alpha transparency, which is the same transparency as a single layer inside of Photoshop which means that you can create something that has a drop shadow and it can sit on a web page and that drop shadow will perfectly match up with whatever's underneath. Our files don't have any transparency, so we don't need to save as a ping. That transparency, while it's really cool, it also creates larger file sizes, so we are not going to use ping. We're going to stick with that JPEG and let's see different options and different ways that we can save those JPEGs. Let's take a look at the different ways that we can save out our images as JPEG files. If I come up to the file menu, I have save as. When I come into save as, 
Under Format, I can choose JPEG. When I save an image like this, Photoshop assumes that I'm going to print that image. So it's going to create a larger file format. It's not going to compress my image as much as saving an image for the web. And it's going to give me extra features like embedded color profiles and thumbnail images, little previews that actually take up more space. Because I'm going to the web, I want to keep my file size as small as possible. So this is not a good way to create JPEGs to save as social media graphics. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. Let's take a look at export. In export, I have something called Quick Export as JPEG, Export As, and then I have Export Preferences, and Save for Web Legacy. I also, underneath of all that, have something called Generate. We're going to take a look at all of these. Let's start at the top. Quick Export as JPEG. I can change that file type here in my Export Preferences. When I choose Export Preferences, I have it set to JPEG, quality at 50%. You can change this to whatever you need. I'm going to leave it set there. And the quality for the JPEG, the higher the number, the higher the quality, the larger the file size, the smaller the number, the lower the quality, the smaller the file size. You want to stick somewhere between 80 and 20. So you want the best quality with the smallest file size. And if 20 works for you, that's great. You'll have a nice small file. If 20, you can start seeing JPEG artifacts and it's not a high enough quality, then you can bump that up. This may take a little bit of experimenting with your images. You can have Photoshop ask you where to export it each time, or you can set it up so that Photoshop automatically exports files to an assets folder next to the current document. I'm going to show you how that works. Let's just take a quick look at the files on my desktop. So here in a folder on my desktop, I have my social media template.psd. You can see there's nothing else inside of this folder. If I jump back into Photoshop, come back up to File, under Export, and I simply click on Quick Export as JPEG, nothing happens. But if we jump back out to my desktop, we can see that Photoshop actually created this brand new social media templates assets folder. And if I open that folder and take a peek, it took a look at all of our artboards and it automatically saved them as JPEGs for us. How easy was that? It happened, bam, done. I'm going to show you some other ways of saving out our images. And another way is also going to create these for us. So I'm going to right click on this guy and just say move to trash. And now you can see we're back to nothing in here, right? Let's take a look at export as. You have some options in here. So here you can specify the quality of your image to be exported. The left side gives web designers plenty of options. We don't need to worry about that. But you can see that it's giving us all of our artboards as options. And then over on the right hand side, we have our format. So if you wanted to change your format, you can. I'm going to go ahead and click on Export All. It's asking me where I want to export everything to. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in my social media graphics folder and click OK. I can see all of those graphics have been saved inside of that folder and they're on the same level as my social media template. So another fast, easy way to save everything out. So again, I'm going to throw these in the trash so that we can see other ways of saving. So back in Photoshop, under File, I have something called Save for Web Legacy. You can see it's showing me basically nothing. It's not even acknowledging these artboards and my images. So Save for Web Legacy is not an option for the way we're working right now. Back up under the File menu, I have this other thing called Generate. In order to use Generate, I need to rename my artboards or rename my layers. In our case, we want to save the entire artboard out as a single image. So I'm going to go ahead and rename my artboards. Over in my Layers panel, I'm going to start with Facebook, and I can call this Facebook JPEG. I'm just going to do one so you can see how it works. I'll leave the other ones with their normal names. And back up under File, 
if I go to generate, all I have to do is click on this. And then if we come up again, you can see it now has a little check mark next to it. So again, it seems like it did nothing. However, if we take a look in the Finder on my desktop, again, it created a social media template assets folder, and there's my image. The great thing about Generate is when Generate is checked, if I make changes to my actual Photoshop file, it's automatically going to update these assets for me. I don't even have to think about it. So Generate is a great option as well. In this clip, I want to show you how you can share your social media graphics directly in your social media channels. We have two places that we can access this. Up in the File menu, underneath of Generate, we have something called Share. It comes over to the right side of the page and it's giving me these options. And I can access that same information. I have a little button that says Share Image. Same box comes up. I prefer to share small images, so I have it set to small. I have Facebook and Twitter set up. If I click on Twitter, we can see that I can make a post. Let's make an actual post using Facebook. All of my artboards are automatically going to be included as a single image file. I simply need to type out my message, hit post, and I get a swooshy sound that lets me know that my post has been sent to Facebook. Now if we take a look on Facebook, you can see there's my post. Quick and easy. Let's talk about how we can save a template. Now that we've gone through all that work to create all of our social media graphics, this is most likely a task that you're going to be performing over and over. So it would be nice if we can have a template available for us to use any time. You can choose to delete the content inside each one of these artboards if you like. For this exercise, I'm going to leave it as is. And if I open up my CC libraries, I love to save stuff in my libraries and I know it's always there and super easy to access. If you wanted to just save one artboard, you can save one artboard. Over on my layers panel, I'm gonna grab this Facebook artboard and I'm just gonna drag and drop it into my social media library. And it saved that single artboard. If you want to save the whole file, I can shift click on all of the layers. So I have them all selected. Just go ahead and drag and drop them onto your libraries. And that actually gives me my entire file in my libraries. Now, if I double click on that file, you'll see that it opens up in its own document so I can work on it. So here's my original and here's the one from the library. It's exactly the same. So now I have a template that I can use and I have quick, easy access to that template inside of my CC libraries. Of course, I can also simply click on the file and say file save as and save a copy of this document to my computer and open it at any time so I can have kind of a master version of it to use anytime I'd like. In this module, we defined file formats, including JPEG, GIF, and PNG. I showed you how you could export and generate your images from Photoshop. We shared our images to social media directly from Photoshop, and we saved custom templates to our desktop and in our CC libraries. In this course, I showed you how to create new documents for social media using artboards. We designed backgrounds using patterns that we created in Adobe Capture and used gradients. We also use Content-Aware Crop and Content-Aware Move to alter our images, making way for type. I showed you how to add type and text to your images as well as format it and introduced you to Adobe Typekit. In the end, we saved our images as JPEGs, even shared them directly to our social media channels, and saved ourselves a template to be able to use in the future. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.